All right, welcome everybody, everybody here in the room at the Bendigo Goldfields Library, but we also have um, some people joining us uh, live via Zoom today. This is the Discovering History seminar series, and my name is Dr. Emma Robertson, and I'm an Associate Professor in History at the La Trobe uh, campus here in Bendigo. Oh, thanks John. <laughs> we have some fans in the room. <laughs> so I'm, I haven't got my lectern to put this on today, but I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging that we are meeting here in Bendigo on beautiful Jarrah country, um, and there may be well be people joining us from different parts of Australia. Um, we'd like to acknowledge really the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet here and on the lands where people may be joining us. And I'd certainly like to pay my respects to elders past and present, and especially extend my respect to any First Nations people, whether they're here in the room with us or joining us um, on live on Zoom. You can also find our Discovering History seminar series on YouTube if you want to catch up on sessions that we've missed. Um, this is a partnership ongoing between La Trobe with the Bendigo Goldfields Library and Bendigo Regional Archives Centre. And we have some great sessions coming up. Look out for those. The next one is on Soldier, soldier Settlement uh, on King Island. But today, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, our two speakers. We've had a lot of illness and all sorts of misadventure uh, leading up to this session. So some of you may have seen we had advertised Katie Holmes, Laurie Zion and Sue Martin. Unfortunately, uh, they're not able to join us. I think they may be uh, watching on Zoom. But we do have two fantastic speakers. We have behind me, hidden, um, I will reveal them soon, uh, Dr. Karen Twigg. Uh, Karen is um, a graduate, a PhD graduate of La Trobe University. She was a researcher on the Mali project, which some of you may be aware of, and is now the project officer on this project, which they're talking about today, Parched uh, History of um, History of Drought in Victoria, is that, is that correct? Yes. Um, so I'm joined by Karen today, and she'll be presenting on uh, work on the Federation Drought. And Karen is also joined and will be in conversation with um, the resident artist on this project. Um, and I have my little buyer on the phone. We've got multiple technology going on. Uh, the resident artist here that we have today, it's fantastic to see here, is Ponch Hawks. And Ponch Hawks' body of work encompasses many aspects of the cultural life of Melbourne and Australia. Looking at critical issues from a feminist perspective, She's created works that explore intergenerational relationships between um, the body, sport, masculinity, science, theatre and performance. And she's published several books, including Best Mates, which is a study of male friendship. And she's been honoured by a solo show at the National Gallery of Victoria. And being represented in Melbourne Now and Know My Name at the National Gallery of Australia. And is represented in most major public galleries, so look out for Punch's work. She's also worked on assignment in Africa, the US, and Europe. Her playful and irreverent work, 500 Strong, in which 464 women over 50 pose naked, has just finished a two-year tour. I don't know if anyone was lucky enough to see that. And currently she's been working on Parched, which we're talking about today, a University of Melbourne and La Trobe University research project looking at cultural and social responses to drought. And in response to the state of our waterways after the recent floods, she's hard at work on a new series, which is called Beautiful Plastics. And the punch would also like to let you know she is a dog lover and footy tragic. Do I need to say which team? Or no? <laughs> we better not say which team. Um, so, you know, later. later. Yeah, later, when, when everyone's wants so. <laughs> Let's not uh, jinx it. So, uh, it's a really great pleasure to hand over to our uh, session today, and I'll hand over to Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma, for that uh, very warm and lovely introduction, and it is really a delight to be here tonight. Can you all hear me fine? I have, I've got no one saying they can't hear me. So. <laughs> That's good. Just before I start my, my short presentation on the Federation drought, I, I thought it would be valuable to give um, just a little background to our project. Um, as Emma said, it's called Parch Cultures of Drought in regional Victoria. Uh, and it's a, it's a project funded the, under the Australian Research Council Special Research Initiative, and um, it's a three-year project going until 2024. The project uh, includes a research team from La Trobe University and the University of Melbourne, and we're exploring how people and communities have lived through and managed drought over time and in four different regions of Victoria, 
those regions being Mildura, Bendigo, Shepparton, and Albury Wodonga. Um, and in each of those places, um, we also will have an artist in residence. And um, of course, the wonderful Ponch is part of our Bendigo Artist in Residence pro program. So the droughts we're especially focusing on are the long droughts, what we call the long droughts of the last 120 years, um, the Federation drought, the World War II drought, and the Millennium drought. Um, and for the Bendigo area, um, thus far, we've, we've mainly focused on the uh, Federation drought and the Millennium drought. So our project consists of a fairly novel interdisciplinary team um, examining the different cultural understandings of drought. And I say novel because we all come from very different discipline areas. Uh, myself and uh, Professor Katie Holmes are, are both cultural and environmental historians. We also have uh, Professor Sue Martin and Dr. Tom Ford, who, who come from uh, the literary, literary studies area. Professor Laurie Zion is a media scholar. Professor Jacqueline Milner, who is a creative arts scholar here at uh, Bendigo La Trobe, um, has expertise in representation of place and environment. At Melbourne Uni, we have Dr. Lyndon Ashcroft, who is a lecturer in climate science and science communication. And we also have a, a fabulous PhD candidate attached to the project, Rochelle Scoff. Uh, so as you can see, we, we're a varied bunch, um, and we're all dif bringing our different disciplinary perspectives to this project. This is a photo of my great-grandmother, Nell Burrows. And I wanted to begin by giving you a, a super, super brief outline of her life. Nell was born in Bendigo at Emu Creek before her parents took land at Canary Island, uh, which some of you may or may not know is on Bendigo's Northern Plains in 1879. Unfortunately, it was bad time. It was the beginning of a run of, of extremely dry years. Uh, so it was a real struggle to keep the farm afloat. And Nell's father, as a result, became a, a very strong local advocate for irrigation and a, a commissioner on the local irrigation trust. Now herself, right in the very midst of the Federation drought in 1900, married my great-grandfather, Will Twig. There they are on their wedding day. And they moved to nearby Yarrawalla, where Will worked as a water bailiff, which was extremely ironic, as it turned out, since almost all the water had dried up uh, due to the drought. So both both now and Will absolutely knew uh, from, their, from their own life experience a huge value of water in a dry landscape. And it was this that shaped their decision to select land here at, at Bears Lagoon near Serpentine in 1906. And you can see the reason for their decision marked at the very bottom of this sales brochure. It's a line the arrow is pointing to and that line is a surveyed route of the Waranga Western Channel, which was very soon to bring permanent stock and domestic water to the Northern Plains. And you can see that little blue square there. Uh, that's the, the, the land that Nell and Will took immediately adjacent to the channel. They built a house, Nell raised her family here, and it continues to be farmed by my family. Now, I, I want to open with this story, I think partly just to give you an insight into to why I have a particular interest in exploring drought in the, in the Bendigo region. But I also want to highlight the influence drought has on people's actions and choices. In the rest of my paper, I'll be speaking in more general terms about the Federation drought. But, but all the way through, I, I'd like you to bear in mind that for countless people, and, and for, for animals and for plants, the impact of dry seasons was felt at a very, very individual level. So the Federation drought was a prolonged period of dryness that parched much of Australia between 1895 and 96 and extending to 1902 and the early months of 1903. And this map, I think, is, is shows a, a really good, gives a really good idea of how extensive the drought was. Periods of low rainfall, as, as most of us now know, is an inherent part of our climate in Australia, and something that Indigenous people had adapted to and managed over millennia. 
In the period since European settlement, the Federation drought looms large, although in the Bendigo region, the late 1870s and early 1880s were also extremely dry, as you can see in this, this, this quite wonderful graph that Lyndon, our climate scientist, has prepared. Um, that little, that first orange rectangle there um, shows that, that period of, of extended dry years between uh, about 1877-1878 to about 1884-85. The impact of the Federation drought was arguably more intense and widespread. Settlement had expanded into semi-arid areas such as Amali and the soil was also depleted through overstocking and overcultivation, all of which made the land and the people more vulnerable to drought and its effects more visible. So working with two other team members, Laurie and Lyndon, I've been looking at how this drought was reported in Bendigo. Bendigo at this time was one of Victoria's largest inland towns with a with a flourishing population of about 30,000 people. And it was also a key service centre for an expansive agricultural hinterland stretching to the north, including the Northern Plains and the Mallee. And it boasted two major newspapers, the Bendigo Advertiser and the Bendigo Independent. <coughs> and using the National Library online search engine Trove, we conducted a search using the keyword drought. And as you can see here, I hope, um, we came up with a, with a lot of references. The number of articles very much reflected the severity of drought conditions. And you can see those references skyrocketing in, in 1902 when the drought was at its peak. So from those, those articles, we used Trove's capacity to rank according to relevance. And we, we selected 350 articles for close reading and analysis. And it was soon clear that several key themes were emerging. And today I wanted to focus on just two of those themes. The first, first one was the fear that Bendigo itself would run out of water. Uh, this is a reservoir at Malmesbury, part of the Colliban system and the main storage dam for Bendigo um, at that time. But there was also, at this time, an enormous drain on it. Not only was it not being replenished, um, by winter rainfall. It also had to supply the needs of private households that needed water, including for what were often very well tended and loved gardens. So this is a wonderful photograph here uh, showing, showing a, a Bendigo garden. Bendigo's public parks and reserves also needed water, as well as its famous avenues of street trees. And Bendigo's mining companies, of course, swallowed vast amounts of water for crushing batteries and also for sluicing. Um, at, at incredibly subsidised rates, I have to say. And through most of the Federation drought, water trains were also taking water from the Malmesbury Reservoir to relieve water destitute settlers in the Mallee. Um, and that, that continued pretty much all through the Federation drought. So by mid-1897, the water in the Malmesbury Reservoir was at extremely low levels. The Independent estimated they only had about three months supply left. Uh, and, and both papers, I, I would say, went to town uh, with vociferous editorials calling for a new water storage. That water storage was eventually approved and become the Upper Colliban Reservoir. But it wasn't completed until 1903. And so Bendigo continued to face the constant anxiety of running out of water, and, and that is a, a repetitive theme in the, in the reportage at this time. And it meant that at various times, water for mining was cut off. Uh, there were various grades of when, um, who got water and who, who got their supply cut off first. Uh, sluic sluicing operations first, then crushing batteries. And by November 1902, the water restrictions also extended to, to both private and public gardens. So the second theme, and, and I would say this was the most dominant theme was the plight of settlers in Bendigo's farming hinterland. Here settlers were facing dried up dams and tanks as well as shriveled crops and starving stock. Uh, and it's quite remarkable uh, across the country at this time sheep numbers fell to half the number recorded before the drought. And the situation was particularly grim in the recently settled Mallee where there was no permanent surface water at all and no established stock and domestic supply system. 
And the Bendigo Papers covered the plight of settlers in, in great detail. Uh, this was, was helped actually by the network of local correspondents that both papers had um, that would send in uh, reports by rail or telegraph uh, of conditions in their, in their local area and uh, those reports were also printed in the papers. And a particularly strong uh, narrative that, that, that came through was it was around settlers' attempts to, to alleviate the suffering of their starving stock. Straw roofs of sheds were, were pulled down and fed to sheep. So a correspondent travelling through, through the area north of Bendigo talked about um, sheds bereft of roofs. Some were able to access hay, which um, I think is what this settler uh, is feeding out to, to stock, although it doesn't look like it will go very far with all those sheep. Others chopped tree branches for, for sheep feed and at Lake Boga here, uh, breeds were gathered for cattle feed. And I think it was significant um, also that Bendigo journalists had uh, ready access to the spectacle of emaciated animals because the regional stock market here in Bendigo was just down the, down the road from um, the, the offices of the press. And at the same time, the, the new pa newspapers were also reporting on truckloads piled with dead sheep that travelled right through the centre of Bendigo en route to the bone mill. Uh, and they, they wrote about how this brought home both to them and to, to other urban dwellers in Bendigo the reality of the drought. So reporters were clearly drawing on a, an established iconography of skulls, skeletons and dead carcasses in the way they wrote about the drought at this time. As a, I guess a sort of a shorthand to convey its severity. This image here is, is an earlier one from the Australasian sketcher in 1886, but it was really rare for daily newspapers at this time um, to have the resources to include photos or images. Um, the photos that I've shown, uh, the last three, were from the Bendigonian, which was a, um, a weekly pictorial that the Bendigo Advertiser produced um, and circulated mainly to, to rural subscribers. But they were, but they're rare. In fact, it's really quite rare um, and difficult to find photos of the Federation drown. This illustration did appear in the Independent in, in 1902, and um, you know I find this a, a it's a really interesting image, which to me seems to be equating the suffering of animals with the suffering of the settler, who's you know looking pretty dejected with that malevolent crow perched on his knee. So I think the picture, the picture that um, we gained reading these reports um, and, and the recurring, uh, recurring ways that the drought was reported really highlighted how active the papers were in cultivating public sympathy for the settlers, who they depicted as heroic pioneers, battling on bravely and stoically year after year, um, and absolutely worthy of every grain of support that could be given. And we found it interesting to think about why this level of support. And I think, you know, partly it, w it was based on self-interest. In earlier decades, the Bendigo Papers had been largely focused on the town's gold mining industry, but a settlement expanded, a growing proportion of their subscribers were, were likely farmers. But they were also influenced by, and, and themselves disseminating, broader ideas about nation building <coughs> that surrounded Federation. European settlers and their families were seen as the right sort of people to populate the country's so-called empty spaces. They were hardworking, they were resourceful, they bring stability and moral heart to the new nation, just as the wheat and the wool and the sheep they grow would underpin Australia's economic prosperity. So if the settlers gave up and left the land, this whole vision would be thrown into jeopardy. So the message from the press was that it was the duty of, of pretty much everyone to rally to settler support. And the papers were doing this themselves. They advocated government subsidies for freight and seed wheat, and they, and they very energetically promoted a range of charitable efforts for drought victims. I love this, um, this, this photo. Uh, this is a, a photo of the, the lady workers for the drought relief, drought relief fund at Little Ironbark. Uh, 
And there's also, um, I haven't got an image of it, but there was uh, an amazing drought carnival held in the very centre of Bendigo in November 1902 with parades of harriers, fire brigade, brass bands and school children. And the press also absolutely got behind the formation of a, a water league here in Bendigo, uh, which is a large group led by um, Bendigo's former mayor and representing all the northern shires. They, they um, sent a deputation of 200 people to Melbourne to visit the Premier. They held a monster, um, a monster meeting in the Melbourne Town Hall. And the main goal of that league, uh, which the, the press certainly hammered home at every opportunity, was that the government needed to act on the proposed Goulburn scheme. And the Goulburn scheme uh, was a scheme that would see a new dam built, the Waranga Dam, uh, in the Goulburn Valley, along with an outflow channel, the Waranga Western Channel, that would send water across the Northern Plains. Um, and that eventually did take place. So the Federation drought finally did break in 1903 with huge downpours of rain across the, the state. Sorry, that's so blurry, but um, it was heralded by all the newspapers at the time. It brought in its wake much soul searching. The Federation drought, um, I, I think, had brought home the fact that extended dry seasons were not, in fact, abnormal in Australia. They were part of the country's natural climate cycle. Um, and if that was the case, that meant that long droughts would reoccur. So if that was the case, what was to be done? The unequivocal solution promoted by the, the Bendigo Press and most other bodies at this time was dams. New dams, channels, weirs and locks to prevent water running to waste in good years so it could be available in the dry years. And my great-grandparents uh, and my, my family going through the generations were certainly the beneficiaries of this strategy, as I illustrated at the beginning, um, and the fact that they were able to, to, to build their farm on the very uh, edge of that Waranga Western Channel. Of course, in 1900, the fact that this type and scale of water engineering might lead to its own problems was not well understood. And that's a, um, a photo of the completed Waranga Basin in 1910. But I wanted to finish with this, this photo. Uh, you, you probably won't be able to pick it, but this is actually me <laughs> swimming in the Waranga Western Channel on, my, on our family farm. And it's um, the 1982-83 drought. Uh, and I actually think, looking at it, there's, uh, there's probably a, a dust storm in progress uh, as well. I put this uh, photo in because at the time, and I was just saying this to Ponch on the way here, I remember my, my father saying to me that this was the most devastating drought he'd ever experienced. And, and myself thinking, I might not ever you know, experience a drought like this myself ever again. And he didn't know, I didn't know, that of course in two decades all previous records would be broken by the millennium drought. So I guess that's a segue into the next part of our, our um, presentation. Just to say, perhaps before I finish, um, just to give some context for the Millennium Drought, that the, the, the Federation Drought went for eight years. By contrast, the Millennium Drought extended for 13 years and parched over half of Victoria, including the Bendigo region. It began in October 1996 and ended in January 2010. And, I, and I'm imagining most of you here, probably everyone, will remember it. It brought many of the same issues I've been talking about, water restrictions, the Colliban system under stress again, as were farmers, but it also brought new impacts. So if um, we rearrange our chairs now, uh, Ponch and I will, will talk a bit more about that part of the project. Um, I have to say I was really excited to, to launch into researching the Millennium Drought because um, I'm an oral historian and it gave me the chance to talk to people about uh, their lived experience of drought uh, and how that perhaps differs between, the, differs between the regions. It's something you can't necessarily get when you're, when you're working in an archive, that lived experience. Um, and our Bendigo region has been the focus over the last few months uh, and I've been really excited to, to work with, um, with Ponch uh, 
on, uh, on the interviews and field research that we've been doing. Yes, yeah, so as I said, I was extremely excited. Um, I'd already planned to uh, work in the area of north of Bendigo and to conduct some oral history interviews as part of uh, our research for this project uh, when Ponch came on board as our artist in residence and was absolutely delighted when, when Ponch uh, was very keen to be involved in that field research and, and those oral history interviews with me. Uh, and it's been a, an absolutely wonderful collaboration over the last few few months, weeks. So, so Ponch, um, I wondered whether you could tell, talk a little bit about uh, what that was like and, and what we did, what you did during that time. Sure, I, I come from the city. I don't know anything about rural life or farming. Um, and I know a whole lot more now than I did then. Uh, it, it was it was quite um, it was quite eye opening for me. Um, I had done some work on drought before. In during the Millennium Drought, I worked with forty other photographers uh, to do. We made a book called Beyond Reasonable Drought, and it was also it went through several editions. And also, it was a travelling show. Now, um, in that book. We had the same sort of representation as we had in these illustrations, which was a lot of dead fish sticking out of mud, a lot of um, sheep that you could um, count their ribs, a lot of farmers looking to far away distance, in, you know, sunburnt land kind of thing. I did, of course, something quite different, which was that I talked to people in, the, in town, in this case it was Mansfield, and asked people if they could only save one thing, what would be? Now, the one thing that they said they would wanted to save was always a tree. But um, I felt like I came to the project knowing something. I don't know anything about the country, but I did know something about drought and its representation, as we currently see it. Um, so I didn't come with thinking, I will do this. I simply came along to see what would happen. I was relying on field research, you might call it, I might call it happenstance and chance and coincidence um, or luck. Um, but Karen and I, um, we just went to people's houses, mostly Karen knew them already. It was easy to get these interviews because Karen comes well credentialed because her family are very well respected in the area. Uh, so we would rock up and interview people about their experiences of the millennium drought, uh, which were often quite shocking, but you know, we'll get on to that. But the first um, thing that somebody said to me set my course for the rest of my thinking about the project and what its outcome might be for me. And uh, a woman talked about how she would never ever do it again. You know, She would never let the lawn die. And she said that she felt that she couldn't uh, water the garden or the lawn because there were water restrictions and everybody would think that was a bad thing to do. She personally also thought it was a bad thing to do, I think. And so she let it go and she said, and I walked out the front of my house and it was just dirt. And to the side of the house it was dirt and the other side of the house it was dirt and it was dirt behind. It was just dirt everywhere. And I'll never do that again. It was so bad for my mental health. And I was really struck by this. Um, I'm quite interested in the place of lawn anyway, but also two other people without any prompting said exactly the same thing to me. And I'm sure that if we had gone on interviewing people or even the next interviews you do, the people will say the same thing, that their mental health was really critically engaged with that piece of green around their house. Now, um, the lawn generally, uh, do you want to ask some questions? No, no, that's fine. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Um, the lawn, like in the suburbs, the lawn is the male domain. You know, the, the activity happens generally at the back of the house, and the lawn is what it's about control and it's about showing, you know, what you have and how you can maintain your land, given that you have to do a lot of fertilizer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, in the country, I found that mostly it seemed to be the women who had were in charge of the lawn and the garden. You know, perhaps because they had small children or they were at home and their 
husband stroke partner was um, out on the tractor. And so the lawn became their domain, which is, you know, kind of different than it is, as I said, in the suburbs. And so that, I think, is why that those pieces of green were just absolutely so important. And it was very, uh, I absolutely agree, it certainly was a, something that came up so many times, particularly talking to women. And that, that sense of, in a dry landscape, when everything else was brown and parched and dusty, just the visual relief of seeing something green and flourishing uh, and the morale, the, the benefit that was to morale um, and, and a sense of nurture and, and um, somewhere pleasant to come home to. Um, Poncha, I, it was really when Poncha came along to our team meeting and uh, said that she'd never been on a farm before, we were all a bit aghast. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I think Ponch uh, she said to me that she approached going, doing this field research almost like going to a foreign country, you know, with, with eyes wide open and just to, to, to absorb what, what she could. Are there any other um, observations or reflections, Ponch, around that, that difference between urban perspectives and rural perspectives that, that struck you? Oh, one thing was, uh, not necessarily that difference, not the urban rural difference, but I was kind of surprised at the regard that people had for their animals, livestock and, uh, and also domestic animals. I don't know why I was surprised or I thought I didn't, I guess I never thought about it as well, but, but people cared so much about the drought because it meant that their animals were starving and you know dying of thirst and they had to send them off to be shot or they had to sell them for tuppence you know or all the work that had gone into you know that that particular flock of sheep the other thing that i was really struck by was the community connection um, because the drought has really transformed that last millennial drought has really transformed that east Lodden area where we were, I believe, or it's also what people said. I don't know if people are familiar with it. It's that area between here and Kerrang. You probably all know it really well. And probably got people, you know, people who live there. But it's quite featureless. There's hardly any outstanding features, and it's 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 still now even when we just had the flood. It's still pretty brown, sort of land, um, and it's changed a lot recently because a lot of people have left. A lot of farms have closed down. They've either been amalgamated or when there was the water buybacks, the dairy farms sold their water and then there was an opportunity to leave the land that they probably never would have had. Um, and uh, people stopped, that, that meant that there weren't so many people to go to church, so the church is closed down, there weren't so many people to go to sporting clubs. And so often, like, when I, I was going to cry when I was at Dingy and I saw the tennis courts just in complete, you know, disrepair. And it had been, people had talked about these really active tennis lives they had going um, out with their community. And so the, the community connections that were um, really strong or apart were, were so important to people, like the Calville, or I know I'm going to say it wrong, Calville, the Calville Footy Club. Um, it's a very strong footy club, it's also got a netball club. Um, and People talked about how fantastic it was that they could go to the footy and during the drought forget about it. Or someone else talked about they in a hockey team and for an hour they could get away from the kids and stop thinking about the drought. Even though the ground they played on was so hard that would you'd get damaged by sort of hitting the deck. Um, but people rallied around those things. So going to the footy was a chance to meet your neighbours, talk about what was going on your property. Um, to feel envious about someone else's outcomes or to feel like, you know, perhaps you were managing better than they were or whatever, but to be together. And someone said this really interesting thing, which was, you know, no matter what the government put on, they couldn't put it on anything that made us feel like this because they just had felt together as a community. And there were also a number of um, community groups, like uh, at that footy club, one woman was running, you know, like a morning tea, which may feel like nothing, but it meant that, you know, 10 or so women could come uh, every week and sit down, make, have a coffee. She learned she would made herself into a barista, then a machine and everything, have a coffee and have a natter and find out what was going on in everybody else's lives and have some social life. 
you know, which is often not available to older people. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And, and certainly it was, I think someone also said that it was, for them being involved in their sporting club was better than therapy, you know, that it was cheaper than going to therapy and um, the, the, the sense of, of it being a morale lifter after they'd finished playing netball or football or whatever it was, was profound. Um, Poncho, I know one of the other things that came up for us um, was the impact that, that the drought had on between generations. I mean, one of the interesting um, points that, that I remember was that uh, people talking about uh, talked about uh, discussing the drought with their parents and their parents saying they'd actually lived through the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, that's when they'd been farming, they were boom years and looking to their parents for advice and in fact um, their parents not having experienced a drought that went on, they were really having to look back to their grandparents' experience um, of the, the Second World War drought to, to connect with a drought that had gone on for that long. Um, and also the impact on their children of having to live through such an extended dry period. I really think that often they hadn't thought about what was the impact on the kids. But then, you know, when you asked and spoke more, they would say, oh, we didn't go anywhere. You know, I think it's often hard for farmers to go on holidays anyway to leave the property to need someone else to look after it. But, you know, they couldn't, have, they couldn't go to a lot of things. They didn't have entertainment other than what was provided by the community. and. Uh, I believe that the local school out there was really um, very helpful because um, they sort of said, well, if the kids, if there's trouble in the community, everybody's in trouble. So there was, they managed to get government grants and subsidies for outings and things like that. But we heard a lot of talk about how um, kids just never wanted to come back to the farm. They never, they just <coughs> knew after living through that drought and what, how hard their parents had worked and their parents' friends and their family, that they never wanted to have to work like that. They, um, it was described by one person as, those people have got broken bodies. You know, okay? So um, I think that the drought really did, and, but for some people, some young people, of course, they've gone back to being farmers. But uh, it, it certainly had a, a generational impact. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so, so given that, I'm not quite sure how we're going for time, but... but plenty of time. Yeah, we've got plenty of time. Um, one of the reasons that it's just so exciting having Ponch on our project is to have an artist and to have a, an artist's um, perspective on, on what uh, I would see as an historian in a certain way. Uh, I'm also somewhat of a local to this area. So I'm curious... Uh, Ponch, as to how you, you think about, um, as an artist, some of, of what you encountered and you, your process for working through that? Well, you know, my, my main practice is that I'm a photographer, but I hardly took any photos up there. Um, and I think I thought it's not going to be a photography project necessarily. It might have some photographic elements, but it's going to be something else. Um, there's something about the scope of the dirt that just sort of had such an impact on me and that's the kind of way I've been thinking about about the earth, if you like. Um, but then you, you go through an idea and you think that'd be great and then you go, okay, I'll work that out. And then you work, hmm, that would cost X amount of dollars for me to make that work and would I be able to do it? Would I be able to get that? And that process, um, I actually really enjoy it but it's, it really does affect the outcomes of what you actually decide to do. And there was something about, I went, one of, the, one of my best encounters, um, which happened on every Tuesday I was up there, was with the East Loddon Historical Society. And it's a, historic, a very good local historical society run by a group of five or six women. They've got a lot of stuff, got a lot of objects, but they've also got quite a good catalogue and, um, uh, a, a, a lot of letters and diaries. And they talked me about this, <coughs> just in conversation, they talked about this place called Terek, Terek, because uh, we've been talking about indigenous impact in the area. And so I drove out to Terek, Terek, which turned out, did, is anybody here know Terek, Terek? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
it's a beautiful um, crop of rocks. I guess it's, what is that, sandstone, limestone? It's granite. 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 granite? Yeah, it's okay. surrounded by calactrus that only grows there, a type of native pine. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. No, you go, please go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I went out there and I, and I climbed up to the top of, top of that rock and looked out over that vast um, lowlands, those sort of, even, but no, they're not in drought. They looked like, to someone like me, like they are in drought and thought, how, how, will this, how will this affect what it is I'm going to do? So that, that's the way I was sort of thinking about exploring that. When I came back, I had a lot of photos of rain gauges. I had a lot of photos of lawn. Um, I had quite a few photos of dust storms. Um, I, you know, I photo of the channel and a series of other photos and just other things that sort of just struck me. But how that will end up, not altogether sure, depending on what we're going to do, I suspect. So are there any, any questions about that? Anybody want to talk about how you do that? How do I? Do I'm going to talk about another 15 minutes. So oh, 15 um, minutes? Yeah. We've time, yeah. we, we have timed it perfectly. <laughs> I, um, if, if, if we wanted to leave about 15 minutes for questions because we're really keen to, to respond to some of the, the queries people might have. Um, yeah, but I, I think that's pretty much um, all that we had to chat about. So well, we can keep on talking. Well, we can talk we about want the audience to talk to us now. Come on, audience. <laughs> I've got, I've got a question. Yes. Um, did you see the Aboriginal wells up at Terrick? I did see the Aboriginal wells up at Terrick. Yeah. Um, if you're referring to the sort of yeah, yeah, holes yeah. in the in the rock where uh, up there on a very bright day, sunny day actually, and there was water uh, in, in, in those pools and clearly it was a place where people went to get water. And I also believe, although I didn't, I was told about this later, that there's in fact been some carving in some of those um, pools in Territoric, which provide a little channel so people could were able to channel the water yeah. that was in the pools. Yeah. It's very beautiful. Mm. Um, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, I've got one uh, about pioneer spirit. Karen, you mentioned in the, in the, you know, the Federation drought this, you know, this idea of you know, parades and and fire brigades and stuff, and I, and I and I wonder whether that that spirit still remains, and how it kind of how it's displayed even these days, or in through the, the millennial throughout. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think there there is still very much a. I mean, one of the things that we've been looking at in this project is is whose interests get represented in drought um, and certainly as I said in the, in the Federation drought it was um, there was certainly a spotlight on what was happening with the settlers uh, you know and I guess uh, there, there could be an argument that there's still uh, there's still a focus on rural issues in in drought and the the the, uh, the difficulties that that people on the land face, uh, when of course there are people who are reliant on agricultural industry also face face difficulties and challenges as well. It's interesting, I, I think, um, for me, being part of this field research with, with Ponch and doing oral history interviews in my own home territory, as it were, to, to think through how, in fact, some of that that narrative or that mythology of the the pioneer spirit gets people through these hard times you, you know there is a sense in which um, people refer back to particularly if they've been on the land a long time to family stories about their grandparents having great grandparents having got through the federation drought or the second world war drought and and it is it is it can be a source of can be a source of strength you know that you know we um, they got through, we, you know, if they got through, we can get through. Poch and I were talking about this a little bit on the way here, but saying there's also, of course, another side to that where, um, where it puts, it, it um, makes it, if, if, if things are really tough and it is difficult to, to keep going, then there's a sense of failure if you choose to to depart the land and 
um, I think one of the, the other things that came out of our interviews meant when people when we talked to people about what had what had what learnings had come from the, the millennium, millennium drought and a number of people said mental health you know much much more recognition now of the, the mental health strains of a drought and how there needs to be far more support put in place and people are a bit more aware of that now. So I, I guess that's a bit of an um, ambivalent answer to your question. I think it, it can be helpful. It can also probably, in some circumstances, be very unhelpful. Um, I was just wondering, so within the data that you showed, like I think it was sort of 18, from 1896, was it? Uh, 1896? Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, within the newspapers and the articles and all the information you went through, whether they sort of looked at sort of pre-colonisation, uh, I guess knowledge about droughts or things, like whether that was coming up within the newspaper articles, whether people sort of knew these kind of things were possibly coming, the predictions, I guess? Uh, no, there was, um, there was certainly, we, we, we were very um, aware and vigilant, uh, wanting to, un to understand whether the indigenous knowledge was something that was, um, on, was considered or yeah. given, given any weight. Um, there were two references in that whole time period from actually 1895 to 1902. There were two references we found, uh, which in both cases were uh, talking to uh, Aboriginal people who were predicting rain, and yeah. but they were, were were treated in a very dismissive way. Okay. Um, a, another answer to your question uh, is, and it's such a shame, Linda, our uh, climate scientist, is not here because there is a lot of research being done now into uh, the paleoclimate. So the, the climate of Australia prior to colonisation yeah. uh, and the evidence coming out of that is, is very much supporting this, that, that, that Australia's climate has been prone to these long periods of dry um, for, for a very long time. It's certainly not, not something new. And of course with, with the Enzo effect we now know that that's, that's always been an influence on the Australian continent. Also, um, we didn't find a lot of credence given to Indigenous knowledge about the area, although people who had um, some reference, some uh, notions or some evidence, if you like, of Indigenous occupation on your land were actually pretty proud of it. Uh, yeah. I don't know that they, that had always been the case, but it, it certainly was the case that we'll, people we spoke to. But I, you just also have the sense of so much damage has been done to the land. I mean, the, the you know the the colonisation and the farming methods we've used, and for example, you know it's probably not a very popular thing to say, the sort of cropping methods we're using now, and the amount of fertiliser and so on chemicals that have to go. I mean, how it just has to end badly in the end. Mm. You also kind of sorry. Yeah. You also sort of kind of hinted on um, like the ways of maintaining water in sort of big areas. Um, so with the building of like the uh, reservoirs and dams and things. So uh, was that, as the drought sort of became worse, was that sort of just always the answer that people went to? Engineering. People love a bit yeah. of engineering, yeah. <coughs> um, yeah, it, it's just like, you just talk to people and water is everything, you know, water yeah. is life and, um, you know, if you're on land and you don't have access to water, you know, like what can your future be and yet people are still saying, just one more year, we just need, you know, just one more good crop, we'd be fine, you know, the drought will end soon and people are, I was talking to, we were talking about this on the web as well, I saw it as optimism, that people, if you're a farmer, you have to be optimistic, I think. Um, yeah, um, it, it does seem to me, certainly there's a whole narrative around Federation was that um, the, 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 the water engineering dams were, were part of that, that, uh, that narrative around 
building this great that the, 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 the limitation to uh, Australia becoming more prosperous was water and so um, if you could conserve water in dams so that that was seen as the answer irrigation of course was was very much part of that um, I was interested looking at these articles in in the Bendigo newspapers because there there have been some historians that argue that the Federation drought was actually the first time that farmers settlers started uh, there was a little bit more critique around where the European practices farming practices um, working up the land were actually uh, were they actually exacerbating the effects of drought? Sorry, what was that? When was that being questioned? Well, some historians have found that with the Royal Commission into what was going on in the pastoral areas of New South Wales, that um, there was beginning to be a critique of those farming practices. We actually found no evidence of that in the Bendigo papers. There didn't right. seem to be any sense that. Um, that settlers might have been actually, that the effects of the drought might have been exaggerated because of farming techniques and the dust storms. There yep. was absolutely huge dust storms, uh, particularly in 1897 and 1902. Um, that they were called brickfielders. I don't know whether people here are familiar with that term, that it, where um, it would, three o'clock in the afternoon, it was, it was as dark as, as night. But there was no connection between those dust storms and the and the working up of the land, the ploughing practices um, that we could find. Thank you. Yes, we've got a question um, from Katie Holmes on Zoom. Um, uh, I'm interested to ask Karen if she detected different kinds of responses to uh, the impacts of drought on men and women, and how. Yes, I'm sure you sure you did. Both of us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Katie. And uh, yes, it's it's a it's a really strong interest of mine um, to to be attentive to to those differences, and it's something that that Ponch and I certainly talked about with the interviews. I think that uh, perhaps going back to um, the, the the earlier question around the you know the pioneer mentality, perhaps it's. It's clearer that that men have a have a sense of of wanting to um, that that resilience and that stoicism and that um, keeping on keeping on is is really strong still with many men that you, you talk to. Where my experience is when talking to women, they're more inclined to to talk about the cost, to talk about. The cost to themselves, to their, particularly to their families, you know that they, they see the cost, and, and they're more a bit more prepared to talk about it. Um, also, the women are often the ones trying; they're, they're doing all the emotional labour. They're the ones trying to keep um, everyone in good heart, to keep the show on the road, and that's something that, that Ponch might want to talk about. It certainly mm -hmm. came out strongly in our recent interviews. Yeah. Also, there are, women are often like the people who keep the show on the road by going out and getting a job two or three days a week. You know, they always say to a farmer, "You should marry a nurse, you know, a school teacher." <coughs> so it meant that some women could still go out to work, and that that money um, put food on the table or put shoes for the kids when there was no other income coming out coming from the farm, um, and it's not really acknowledged, and um, it does. You, know, you can press for it, and you find out. And you find it the case in most people we spoke to. Is it not? Yeah. Um, but the women's contribution—it's just—it's not out there on the tractor. It's a different kind of contribution. Um, there was an earlier one. There was someone asking uh, when exactly was the Second World War drought? Um, the Second World War drought is some... Um, I've got my little wrap up there. <laughs> but um, it, it started in 1937. There was a, a, a period... It was one of those um, things that happens in, in many droughts, actually, where there's a... Oh, thank you, George. <coughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, you can see it there, actually. Actually, I think that's got it starting in about 1938 in, 
here in um, Bendigo. Um, but you can see sometimes there's a little glitch or there's a reprieve through the drought um, where, where you do actually get some, some substantial rainfall but that's in the, in, the, in the bigger scheme of things is actually not enough to relieve the cumulative dryness in the soil and uh, replenish the, the water storages. So um, we, we've been looking at, the, uh, at that drought. Um, we've got down to 1937 to 1945, the, the Second World War drought. Um, of course, that drought was particularly um, Amplified, I guess, by the fact that it was during the it was during the Second World War. Um, many men were away in serving in in military service, uh, and it was also a time when the uh, cumulative effects of farming practices in terms of working up the soil led to enormous dust storms. I think we've about run out. It's six thirty. I'm just going to pinch the mic. <laughs> Just, uh, it's just come around to 6.30, um, so we will finish there. Those of you that are in the room, I'm sure if you have other questions, um, Ponch and Karen will be very happy to chat. Thank you to everyone on Zoom, and thank you so much uh, for a fascinating uh, presentation tonight. I'm sure you all join me in uh, giving them a round of applause. Thank you. August, our next session on soldier settlers in King Island. Thanks, everyone. Um, 3rd of August. Oh, 3rd of August, There's there some you go. Fires up the top of the stairs, and I've got some more here. Publicity all ready to go. Well. Thank you well, so thank much. You. Cheers to Audi as well, who does a great job with the team.